Alright guys, how's it going? Over this next year, I'm going to be doing a series of videos on AMD's Polaris and NVIDIA's Pascal. Whenever we get a bunch of interesting news, I'll do a new video so that we can all keep up to date with how it's all progressing. Right now though, for this introduction video, I think the smart thing to do is have a look at a little bit of the near history so that we can set realistic expectations for the upcoming cards. Now, I'm going to be talking a little bit about nanometers and die sizes, that sort of thing here. I really don't want to go over it again, so if you want to know about that stuff, Stuff, check out my Nano Matters video where I do my best to try and explain this as simply as possible. It is a pretty complicated subject and that's why I made the whole video on it. Otherwise, let's start off with AMD. If you don't want a 5 minute history lesson, just click on the screen now. AMD is normally first to a new process node. That is, they were first at 28 nanometer cards, they were first at 40 nanometer cards, they were first at 55 nanometer cards, and so on. It looks again that they're going to be first at 14 nanometer FinFET cards, but let's just have a look at their 28 nanometer cards, as this should give us a good idea of what they are planning on 14. It was actually way back in December 2011 when AMD released the very first 28 nanometer graphics card, known as the 7970 and the 7950. These were based on a graphics chip called Tahiti, and this was their largest chip at the time. They followed up on Tahiti with their Cape Verde graphics cards, that is the 7770 and the 7750. This was their entry level, smallest chip. One month later, in March 2012, they released the Pitcairn class of graphics card, that is the 7870 and the 7850, which was, of course, their mid-range. The architecture of all these cards was known as GCN or Graphics Core Next. When the first benchmarks came out, I was not at all impressed by what AMD had done, especially with the 7970, and I felt that they had left themselves open to a bit of a beating by Nvidia, and that is exactly what happened. It was only a few days after AMD had released their Pitcairn class of cards that Nvidia launched their first 28 nanometer card called the GTX 680, and it was a real eye opener. In most benchmarks, it was between 5 and 15 percent faster than the 7970, and they followed up on the 680 with the GTX. GTX 670 two months later, which was actually a cut down version of the same GK104 chip. Later on in the year, in September 2012, Nvidia released the GTX 660 and GTX 650 graphics cards based on the GK106 and GK107 chips respectively. So by the end of 2012, both companies had a full set of graphics cards from top to bottom, and the general consensus was Nvidia was well ahead. Now, I did say that Nvidia had given AMD a bit of a beating, and you may think, well, 5, 15%, that's not that much of a beating. But in order to understand just how much of a beating it was, you need to look past just the raw performance and also look at other factors, for example, the size of the actual chips in comparison to each other, and also how much power they draw. So let's have a look at that now. What you're looking at here is a comparison of die sizes throughout the generations of cards. Generally speaking, Nvidia has had larger graphics chips, and this has given them a slight performance advantage in some cases. It's not magic, yeah? You've got bigger die size, you've got more transistors, you get more performance. However, larger die sizes do come at a cost. More power, and you can fit less of them onto a wafer, which I'll show next. If you look at GF100, for example, initially this would have been the GTX 480, which was very late and a very hot running chip. It was up against a very good AMD chip called Cypress, which is your 5870. And even though the 480 was slightly faster, you can tell the massive difference in die size means that AMD had basically engineered a better chip at that time. If you now look at Tahiti and GK104, Tahiti being the 7970 and GK104 being the GTX 680, you can see that not only is Nvidia faster, they are also smaller. What this simply means is, the 7970 was only able to get 160 dies per wafer, not even as much as that, that would be at 100% yield, but due to the larger size, the maximum number of chips on a wafer would be 160. GK104 on the other hand, the GTX 680, had a maximum of 195 dies per wafer. So simply put, the smaller size allows Nvidia to get more money from the same wafer. Looking at the prices, the 7970 was $549, however, when the GTX 680 launched at $499, there was only one thing that could possibly happen to the 7970's price. It did, of course, come way, way down. The final nail in the coffin was the fact that the GTX 680, due to having less transistors being a smaller chip, also consumed less power. So it really was a slam dunk for Nvidia. 10% faster, 20% smaller die size, 10% less power, they really just won everywhere. 
A few months later though, AMD released the 7970GHz edition and a new driver, which again put the 7970 back into the lead. The damage was kind of done though, even though the 7970 beats the GTX 680 in almost every game we see now, that initial impression really hurt it and really hurt AMD's bottom line. In 2013, Nvidia retook the lead with a GTX Titan GTX 780 graphics cards based on the GK110 chip. This was a very large chip and it allowed Nvidia to hold on to the performance advantage for quite a long time, up until late 2013 when AMD released their R9290X and R9290 graphics cards based on the Hawaii chip. AMD were actually faster with a smaller chip, however Nvidia had been holding a faster chip back in reserve and the GTX 780 Ti was released a few weeks later. It was only slightly faster than the R9290X and it had a larger die size, so things were looking pretty pretty even by this stage, and then Nvidia changed everything when they released the 750 Ti, the small first generation Maxwell graphics card in early 2014, and then followed up with the GTX 980, the GTX 970, and further Maxwell graphics cards. The Maxwell architecture of graphics cards was pretty mind blowing. The efficiency was simply out of this world, and nobody was really expecting to see this on 28 nanometers. AMD had been prepared to move on a node to 20 nanometers, however the company that makes both AMD's and Nvidia's graphics chips, TSMC, had decided not to make a proper graphics card process for 20 nanometers. Nvidia had anticipated this whereas AMD didn't, so instead of preparing for 20 nanometers, Nvidia looked really closely at the 28 nanometer node and created the Maxwell architecture specifically for it. Now this is going to be important for the next generation. Over at Anantech there is a fantastic article on the GTX 750 Ti release. It's well worth reading if you're interested in this stuff whatsoever, there will of course be a link in the description. At the bottom though of page 3 is what's really interesting, and this is what many in the tech press and many analysts seem to have missed or not seem to have quite understood. Nvidia made a lot of optimizations with Maxwell, but as I mentioned earlier, one of the optimizations was at the transistor level. In other words, they had optimized for 28 nanometers specifically, and this sort of explains it here. Nvidia has gone through at the transistor level to squeeze out additional energy efficiency as they could find it. And the really important part, given that TSMC's 28 nanometer is now a very mature process, that's important because TSMC's 28 nanometers was two years old at this point when Maxwell was first released. With well understood abilities and quirks, Nvidia should be able to design and build their circuits to a tighter tolerance now than they would have been able to when working on GK107, that's the Kepler generation, over two years ago. And for those of you that are really following this, you probably realise that these optimizations that happened two years after 28 nanometer came online, these optimizations are not going to work instantly at the next node. So there's a good chance that Nvidia won't make the huge efficiency leap from the node change that we may otherwise have been expecting. We do however know that AMD has made a massive efficiency leap at 14 nanometers. I went over AMD's Polaris reveal about a month ago, and in the video I thought it was pretty clear that AMD has made some pretty large efficiency gains, now they did compare it to the GTX 950, which is probably the least efficient Maxwell graphics card, so keep that in mind. However, we're talking a few percentage points compared to the most efficient Maxwell card, and while AMD is certainly giving the best case scenario here, for example Star Wars Battlefront is a game that runs very well on AMD cards anyway, there is only so much you can actually do. The demo clearly showed that that their card was vastly more efficient than the Maxwell GTX 950, between two and two and a half times more efficient in performance per watt. This is absolutely massive, and while I do not believe for a minute that Polaris will be twice as efficient as Maxwell, it won't be far away. The question is, given what we know about how Nvidia optimized 28 nanometers with Maxwell, will they also be able to make that almost double performance per watt leap? I will be very very surprised if that happens. So in effect, in the next generation Polaris versus Pascal cards, I would expect AMD to once again be better in both performance per watt and performance per die size. But let's have a look at some other information we have right now. A few days ago at the VRLA Winter Expo, which was sponsored by AMD, Roy Taylor, AMD's corporate VP, let slip one or two little nuggets of information about the upcoming Polaris cards. This is actually a very interesting slide. You can see a list of cards from the high end to the low end, and you can see here that from your really fast dual cards like the R9295X2, down to stuff like the GeForce 970 and the R9290X, there are only 7.5 million units 
installed. That means 7.5 million cards from the GTX 970 up have been sold. This is probably a bit of an eye opener to many of you. Very few people actually buy these cards because very few people are spending hundreds of dollars on graphics cards. It's that simple. I would be surprised if the GTX 970 wasn't more than half of that number. So that should sort of give you an idea of just how few people are buying the really high end stuff like your Fury X's and your Titan X's. I would be surprised that if combined they even hit 1 million million total units. Now the point of this slide is about making graphics cards cheaper and what Roy said was AMD's upcoming Polaris GPU would bring VR capability to a lower price point and this is obviously very important for VR taking off because clearly not all of these 7.5 million people are going to be buying VR headsets. So in order for VR to become mainstream the cost of graphics cards must come down. And Roy basically revealed that the next generation Polaris which we believe to be Polaris 11 the one we saw in the demo was Polaris 10, the entry level one. The one up from that, Polaris 11, is supposed to be at least on par with the R9 290X and the GeForce 970. And of course, because it's on the new 14 nanometer process node, it is a much smaller chip and it is a much more efficient chip as well. The real nugget there obviously was Polaris 11 is going to be at least as fast as a GTX 970. Now I've had a look at it and I believe that it is probably going to beat the GeForce 980 and the R9 390X. And this is only AMD's second level card, Polaris 11. In graphics terms, it's going to be a small chip with extremely good performance. And while it would be great to say it's going to be really, really cheap, AMD needs to make money and it won't be that cheap. Right, so what about Nvidia and Pascal? Well, you probably noticed that I haven't really talked a lot about Pascal in any other video because there's no real information out there yet. So the only thing we can go on right now is a bunch of rumours and what Nvidia themselves are saying. Unfortunately, what they are saying doesn't look very good. They were actually talking about Pascal last month in the Drive PX2. This is part of their automotive business where they're going to put Pascal GPUs and Pascal CPUs, that's the Denver CPUs, into cars and hopefully charge an arm and a leg for it. And their chief executive held up this board, claiming it was a Pascal board with Pascal GPUs. However, on closer inspection, it was actually discovered to be a Maxwell GPU that was on it instead. And if you take a look around about the chip itself, you can see that is GDDR5 memory. It is not HBM memory, which we expect Pascal to have. <laughs> so I'm not sure exactly what the chief executive thought he was doing, but this is certainly not Pascal GPUs that is on this board. A couple of weeks later, this shipping manifest turns up and the tech press had a field day with it, claiming that Pascal was on its way based on what they believed all these parts were. They were right in that these parts are for Pascal chips. However, their analysis was deeply flawed, as pointed out by Charlie at Semi Accurate. Now, Charlie hates Nvidia with a passion and writes an awful lot of bad stuff about them. However, he is generally more than Semi Accurate when it comes to their analysis and news. In this article, he railed against the echo chamber tech press, who all jumped onto the bandwagon claiming that Big Pascal would be out in April this year. And his analysis of the situation mostly makes sense. And based on this manifest, he clearly believes that Nvidia does not have any Pascal silicon. In actual fact, he is wrong as well because Nvidia does have Pascal Silicon, they just don't have the Pascal Silicon that he believed this shipping manifest was for. So in actual fact they are all completely wrong in this right now. It's all about this number here, the BGA 37.5 times 37.5. This is the size of the package for the GPU and it is way too small to be something like the big Pascal, the GP100 chip. And simply looking through older shipping manifests lets you know this. For example, GM200, which is your Titan X GPU, had a package of roughly 45 to 46 millimeters, which is much larger than this 37.5 by 37.5. In actual fact, GM204, which was your GTX 980, had a package size of 40 to 41 millimeters. So instead of looking at the high-end Pascal here, we are looking at Something that's decidedly more mid-range, similar in size to what the GTX 680 would have been back in 2012. The important information here though is this chip is not yet ready and will not be seen for at least 6 months and probably a bit more than that because all these parts are for bringing the chip online. It is not yet ready to go into mass production and may not be for a very long time. Right, it's time to wrap this one up with the facts we have now and a little bit of analysis. We know that AMD has two Polaris graphics chips, Polaris 10 and Polaris 11. We have seen a demo of Polaris 10 and it looks to be very, very efficient. And we believe that Polaris 11 was the GPU that their marketing VP, Roy Taylor, was talking about. 
at the VRLA Expo. Rumours are abound about a third AMD Polaris GPU and we can be pretty certain that it's coming at some point, however we don't know exactly when. It will be bigger and faster than both 10 and 11 however. We know absolutely nothing about Nvidia's low end GPUs yet. The only rumours we've heard have been about GP104 and GP100 which is the high end Pascal. My belief is that Nvidia already has working silicon of the high end Pascal. They certainly have some Pascal silicon in their labs but we don't know which one it is. Based on the shipping manifest it's very unlikely that they have GP104 working in their labs right now. The problem with the GP100, the big Pascal, is that Nvidia is making a lot of changes with this GPU and this stuff is really, really hard. They messed it up once before with Fermi and they could be doing it again. But for now I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and suggest that this big Pascal will be the first Pascal GPU that we see out of Nvidia later this year. Based on the current information we have, my analysis is this. Polaris 10 should be ready about May and should perform around about the GTX 960 level. Polaris 11 will be ready in June and should perform around about the GTX 980. Polaris 12 is a big unknown. It could be ready by July though, possibly August, and it will become the fastest graphics card in the world surpassing the Titan X by maybe 10-20%. The big thing here though is with the move to FinFets all of these are going to be much smaller, much cheaper and far more energy efficient than the mentioned Nvidia cards here. Looking at the Nvidia side of the equation they're late but as discussed previously AMD were normally first to the new node so that's no big surprise. For me though the big Pascal should be ready around about August just in time to take the thunder away from AMD's Polaris 12 which it should beat by quite some distance simply because it is going to be a much larger, much more powerful chip. The middle Pascal should be ready a month later and should be capable of beating Polaris 11 with some ease. So both of these cards are going to be faster than the AMD competition but at the cost of much worse die size. That's very important yeah because it's going to cost Nvidia a lot more money to manufacture these and power draw is going to be worse as well. There's no chance of this going to be another Kepler and Maxwell slam dunk for Nvidia. They should be faster but it's coming at a cost this time. As for the low end, my long held belief which I mentioned in my DX12 video is that Nvidia will simply shrink Maxwell 980 and 960 GPUs down to 16 nanometers from 28 nanometers and that is what Nvidia's low end market will be for 2016. Truth be told, that could happen any time. They could actually be first to do this and maybe the reason why we've heard so little about it so far is because this is exactly what they are planning to do. If they do choose to do this, they're going to be struggling quite a lot against Polaris 10 and 11, especially on cost. So that is my neck on the line and it will be very interesting to see how this plays out over the coming months. As always, there's a bunch of links in the description below. This one got pretty technical in parts, so if there's anything at all you want me to go over, just ask me in the comments below and I'll do my best to explain it. I'll catch you later guys.